Wasn't that great? Uh, how about a round of applause? Larry McCluskey and Tommy Schmidt from the State Project. That was, that was unbelievable. I think uh, all of us are sitting here watching the film thinking, you know, how incredible it was that you were able to do this project. Uh, the scale of it is just unimaginable to us. And uh, obviously not easy. Um, it was 10 years in the making, you were obviously a very young man, you're still young. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, you're really, uh, you've really gained incredible experience going forward. So uh, maybe you can just talk a little bit, or actually what I was going to tell everyone is uh, what, what the program is going to look like. We're just going to talk for a few minutes about the film and about the uh, new Mariinsky. And then, because of this amazing announcement about the uh, project at uh, Lincoln Center, we do actually have a short clip of animation uh, to show you what's going to be done there. Gary's going to talk about that and uh, talk about what, what they plan to do there. So um, maybe we can start off just uh, telling us um, you know, how the Four Seasons Performing Arts Center here led to uh, the project there. Uh, you're not the only people, I guess, that design opera houses, so there's obviously some great expertise and great uh, features that, that they saw. So, can you comment on that? Sure, sure, happy to. And the uh, first thing I'd like to comment, this is a different blue sports jacket that I was wearing. <laughs> 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 I was wearing just a few years ago. Can you hear? Can everybody hear? Um, so they told a little bit of the story. It really is pretty fascinating. Um, uh, uh, Maestro Gergiev and their orchestra traveled the world. I think at that time when we first were introduced, he was doing something like 200 concerts a year outside of Russia. And of course, these the main force of the Mariinsky, uh, the Mariinsky company, of course, performing an awful lot uh, in St. Petersburg and around Russia as well. So you know, phenomenal amount of travel. So they've been around the world. Sort of so, but concurrent with the time when the when the project that had won the first competition was, uh, I think, being deemed unconstructible, unconstructible in Russia for sure, and probably would have been challenging anywhere in the world. So he was touring. Uh, Bob Ramsey was there, hosting them here in Toronto, Ottawa. They toured North America and Canada. So he's in town at Roy Thompson Hall around the time of the opening of the Four Seasons Center, the Opera House here. So they described that visit. Where, where Maestro Bradshaw tours him around the new facility, and it really is that kind of coincidence of the time uh, of his project being maybe challenged and seeing an opera house that's just been completed. So that was the initial meeting. Uh, uh, Jack tells this story, and, and others are telling the story. But Bob put Jack and Maestro Gergiev together at dinner that evening. And if anybody knows Jack, and you get a pretty good feeling for him from, from this film, it didn't take long for them to hit it off. So that, real, that was the introduction. The difference, I think, for us, and I think there were, there were many companies, we understand there were about 10 or 12 companies who then came to Russia. So Jack and I then, re, re, uh, a few weeks later, visited St. Petersburg and toured the site and were kind of introduced to the project by Bill Eric. Uh, so we know nothing about it at that time. We didn't really understand, and when we toured the site, the, the, the ground next to the old theater had been, I think it was demolished. It was, it was an empty site. We didn't realize that there was an enormous amount of underground work had already happened. And Jack refers to it, and you see in the film, that St. Petersburg is famously a swamp, very difficult to build on. There are really no, no basements. There's very little underground construction because it's so hard to build. But they had, contemporary technology lets you build underground, but you basically, effectively you build underground. Concrete is poured underground, you slowly build it up, and then you excavate out of the concrete structure that you have built, and you build a new concrete structure. So, long story to say, when we visited the site, we didn't realize that the foundations were very well along. And no one actually told us that, probably for about three months, as we were slowly getting involved in the project. And that, that whole fall, where we did work, I think other, other companies, of course, were introducing their capabilities, and then the actual competition was held later that year, which we eventually won. Coming back to the Four Seasons, though, you'll the, the I think the core of our of our kind of experience was uh, a, 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 a familiarity and a respect for how the acoustics, the natural acoustic of the hall itself, the, the opera house form, the opera house space, how critical that was to the success of, of the of the building. Would be the success of the project really would be built on that. So enormous amount of respect for that. I think mixed with that are the, the way we approach architecture from, from the, the experience of it and wanting, driving for the experience of the, of the realized project, inhabiting it, 
something that is very comfortable, just like this, this, this theater itself. You spend quite a bit of time in the, in the performance, or in this case, seeing a film. And for that to be a, a really energizing but comfortable experience, that's something that I think Maestro Gergay recognized immediately at the Four Seasons as well, that it was both of those things. So it was almost like timing is everything, where you have this brand new state-of-the-art facility that just opens up, the Maestro's in town, he goes there and sees it and falls in love with it. Yes, that was, it was. But then, it, really building on that is, and, and we, uh, many of the themes here I can kind of mention sort of uh, have been referenced in the movie, uh, in the film. We kind of kept at it, probably um, uh, realized there was a project where I had just finished this project, so I think we were, we were, uh, had been so uh, um, uh, excited and had, had taken such an, an amount of energy from the Four Seasons here in Toronto that we were, we, you know, we realized the potential for the project. And so I think we probably came at it with, with much more enthusiasm. We may have been a bit naive as well, that may have been part of our strength. Uh, not, we hadn't really done any work uh, in, in, uh, in Russia uh, to, to speak of. We'd done work in Europe. Uh, but many companies wouldn't have, but perhaps companies coming from Western Europe were a little bit more familiar with the challenges that, you know, that's a lot of what uh, Joseph is, uh, is building his story around, of course, here is the challenges. Every project has challenges, but, but uh, the, the, you know, the particular challenges of building at St. Petersburg in Russia. So I think we were, we just came at that with a certain amount of enthusiasm, and I think it's very much part of why we persevered. I don't think anybody here will drive past the Four Seasons uh, Performing Arts Center uh, on University without thinking about uh, what you've done now in Russia. Um, so obviously there were challenges. Um, do you want to elaborate a little bit on what it was actually like having to work um, with a different crew there and, and the communication and that sort of thing? So maybe again to, to build on, the, so Joseph has really introduced that theme of the long distance communication. He has a sequence there where we're, we, had, we had weekly meetings, uh, uh, you know, video conference meetings. We were, we were in Russia about once a month, so we were, that was sort of our cycle, four week cycle of being there for a week, traveling back, doing work in Toronto, having weekly meetings, and then again visiting, visiting the, the, uh, the, this is the design stage when we're working in that way. Uh, language challenges. So we have Marina as our as our translator. She's an architect as well. But really, it was it was it was not even cultural challenges. Really, because sort of design uh, uh, design process challenges were very much part of the the outset of the project. The really big challenge we have we had experience in in uh, designing and executing an opera house, but in, in North America, so the North American standards. Uh, Russia was was at, uh, and is of course a completely different kind of bureaucratic jurisdiction. So uh, we were really relying on our local partners, and they had a certain amount of experience, but not quite as much experience as Andre was suggesting. So they were very much learning how to do this as well. And I think that was that was a lot of the frustration for everybody. A very big project in any community. It was it was enormous for Saint Petersburg, and everybody was learning how to do something that is that big. Certainly, the, uh, the the kind of the, the challenges of bureaucracy and the challenges of getting things done are, are kind of well known, and so we were we were learning a little bit about that. Our local partners were, were very good at shielding us from from certain aspects of that. So, but we knew that was going on as well. Actually, just getting things to happen. Um, but that kind of process of back and forth, the process of communication, the pro process of figuring out how to kind of work with language. Uh, one little story I tell people is uh, our, our, our local partners were working with, with some, uh, say, computer programs, which were really uh, North American based, and had some experience with that. And over the course of the first month, we realized, yes, they were familiar with it, not quite as familiar with it as maybe they were, they were leading on. And so there was very much kind of a learning curve on their side as well as we, as we learned to work together. So to transition now to the next big project, uh, I thought it was uh, interesting that you actually referenced the um, Lincoln Center early on in the film when you were looking at the site of the Mariinsky and talking about you know, how it kind of laid out like, like Lincoln Center, and here you are so many years later moving on to Lincoln Center. Um, did you ever imagine that that would ever be in your future? That, that was definitely that was not something that we were we were thinking about at the time. It is interesting, and that, that the reference we made there was actually uh, Gergiev's comparison to what he was looking to achieve in Saint Petersburg. Of course, they have the the historic Mariinsky Theater, which is an amazing facility. 
sorry, they, the, the, uh, the Mariinsky, they had already just finished completing a small concert hall, so they have two theaters. The, the, the opera house that we were, we were designing was going to be the third con kind of uh, facility in the complex, and so I think that was his reference point, was a, a complex of performing arts spaces within an urban, uh, within an urban environment. Uh, Lincoln said, of course, it, it different in its own way, but just that idea that it's, that it's uh, multiple uh, performance venues, all of them, of course, uh, absolutely exceptional in their own ways. So that was interesting. We actually, one of the first times we met uh, the full team, we, we traveled a few times back and forth to St. Petersburg, and then again, because Gary Gibb travels so much, one of our first big design meetings was actually in New York, our theater consultant was based there, and we came and he was performing at, at that time called Avery Fisher Hall, sitting now since renamed Geffen Hall, and we heard the concert there. One of the one of sort of those early remarkable uh, um, uh, experiences where after the concert we'd stay to have a meeting with them because as we said that's what we did in Russia as well, and they were actually uh, testing uh, some uh, you know, incredible violins, Stradivarius violins. So after our meeting, we came out on stage. The concert hall is empty. And he had a couple of his of his amazing violinists testing these instruments. Actually, I'm, I'm going on a bit of tangent. It was one of those amazing stories that are kind of part of these projects, where he actually asked the second violin player to play the instrument because he said, as he said to us as an aside, the guy who's playing it now can make anything sound amazing. I want to hear what it sounds like when a musician plays it. Um, so those kind of connections, though, to uh, to Lincoln Center really sort of started from the very beginning. Um, at, the, at the completion of this project, and certainly I think that's something we found working here in Toronto really led to, to working on the Montreal, the Maison Symphonique, which is in the, which is in the film, uh, at, at the same time as it was leading us to, to St. Petersburg. And I think that's what we were, we kind of had maybe realized at the outset that the kind of the community of, of, uh, of, of designers, architects, acousticians who work on these facilities does tend to be fairly international because there there are you know, one in Canada. There's not there are not that many of them, and so you're sort of part of a group uh, where it has a rare kind of experience. So again, to kind of link the two projects, um, I, I was thinking about how the Mariinsky was uh, kind of a start from scratch, almost not entirely, but somewhat. And now you're going on to David Geffen Hall, which is a reimagination. Uh, so aside from the fact that one's in Russia and one's in the United States, uh, how which is um, more pleasing to you, which is easier to work on, uh, something from scratch or something that you have to uh, deal with the existing project? Oh, I, I would say they're all, they're all... Um, You're happy to get anything. Yeah, well, they're all amazing projects and amazing in their, in their own ways. So, you know, yeah, equal challenge, equal, I think, you know, equally amazing uh, process to be part of. Uh, Gaffin Holly is definitely, uh, it's the particular challenge there is that the, uh, for people who are familiar with it, the, the exterior of the building will remain unchanged. It's the, it's the interior of the auditorium itself that is being completely re, 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 uh, redesigned, rebuilt, reconfigured. I think we're going to show... Why don't little, we show that? Yeah, we'll show a little piece and you'll kind of get a sense for what that looks like. Okay, can we roll that uh, video, please? So just the setup here, I think the first one we're showing is showing how the, the existing, so that's a picture of the existing hall, and then we kind of transition to a, a, a digital model of the existing hall to show all the areas that are being demolished. A key component is the stage is being moved forward so that everybody will be much closer to the orchestra. But then essentially every element of the room from the, the, the seating at the orchestra level, all of the walls, all the side balconies are completely demolished. So really the entirety of the interior room is demolished and then rebuilt in a new configuration. Um, so we're re-raking the orchestra for, for better sight lines and better acoustics. The side tiers are reconfigured. All of this really uh, initially driven by acoustician so that the recipe comes from, from, the, from building new acoustics. But the idea of pulling the room in the, 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 the stage itself into the room by about 25 feet so that everybody is closer to the music. Uh, Gurgiev refers to that at one point when he's looking at a room, that intimacy and that emotional connection that is so much reinforced when you can see the expression on, on in this case, a musician's face. Um, and so that's uh, that ingredient, but as well, just the, the energy of the orchestra, the energy of the music will be just much more tangible uh, to the audience in the new room. So that is really stunning. Um, I'm 
interested to know because the plan, in order to create uh, that intimacy, uh, you have to remove 500 seats from the theater or reduce the number of seats by 500. Uh, how tough a decision was that to make in the economics of having a uh, performing arts center? So we, it, it's an interesting, it was, it's actually had been uh, studied very carefully and already determined as we were starting on the project that from a, from a business model point of view, the, the, uh, the Philharmonic and Lincoln Center had already done the studies with the acousticians truly to understand that making the hall slightly smaller was probably critical to the success of the new project. So, so reducing from 2,700 to 2,200 or a little bit less, they had already sort of built that into their, their model. It was, it's certain, in a strange way, assisted by the fact that they, they are now playing typically to a house that's not entirely full. So their business model now is working on about a 75% complete uh, a, um, full house. So that, that was actually, you know, kind of a, a quirky way, a big, a big step of them understanding that, that was possible because they already are working with a hall. Effectively, it's too big. Um, but the, really, the, the, the second really critical point of that was, I think, a general understanding that that size of room, and you can, you know, there are bigger rooms and you know, or more seats in a house. Some of the historic halls can do it because the seats are a lot smaller and barcodes let you make, let, put more seats closer together. Um, but just the idea that actually achieving a great sound, a great sound in the room, was probably a huge step was going to be achieved by having something around 2,200 seats. That really was so important to them and so important at the outset of the project that they had they, they very much um, built the idea of going forward on the idea that it would be a smaller, a smaller house in terms of the number of seats. So that was a win-win because you didn't have to sell them on the idea of in order to create this, we're going to have to lose 500 seats. So they're, they're all for it. That we were certainly all for that, and they were very. They had done again. Uh, many of these projects do tend to work with studies having been done by acousticians ahead of the project. So they had done all of the analysis of the existing room to know what some of the challenges were, and had already been kind of working with ideas of um, a more, I, I kind of sort of say, contemporary or uh, approach to how the room is configured. Because I think what you're seeing in that the, the little video as well is that we're removing the proscenium in that space and we're bringing the audience all the way around the orchestra. And that, that sort of, uh, that approach to all of us being in one space, that it being a single room, that musicians, the artists, and the audience are together in one space, I think there's something about that that is very much, uh, very much kind of of our time, of, of, and very much wanting, the yearning for that kind of strong connection with the artists themselves, that being in the space together. So there were aspects of uh, reshaping the room, the idea of reconfiguring what, uh, well, they hadn't, hadn't obviously done the design at that stage. They were very open to those sorts of ideas of uh, obviously making the, the music sound much, much better. The idea of smaller seats, but the idea that it would be a transformed experience architecturally and spatially. They kind of came into it with that, uh, that approach. Okay, we're going to take questions from the audience in just a moment, uh, so you can raise your hand and we have a microphone uh, that we can bring around to you. Uh, while we're uh, waiting to do that, uh, just ask one last question. You talked about the transformation of the interior of the hall. Um, clearly, there must have been a lot of other issues with uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, reception areas and all those things. So do you want to just comment on some of the other major items on the list? Yeah, so even though the, the uh, spaces outside of the hall aren't structurally changed quite as much, there are, and anybody, anybody who's, who remembers, familiar with the kind of current Geffen Hall and Rick Fisher Hall, one of the huge challenges, just said from an audience experience point of view, is when you enter from the, from the lobby, from the plazas right now, it is, there is such a chaos of box office and security and coat check and where are the washrooms and how do I move it. Over time, it's just sort of lost its, lost its kind of sense of, of, uh, of clarity. So one of the things that we were doing, there are escalators that, that, uh, that move you from the, from, the, from the low, the plaza level up to the main lobby level. And we're trying to repositioning those, which really frees up an enormous amount of space. The box offices are being transformed so that it's not, a, it's not like a bank teller, it's an open counter and the ability to have a conversation with somebody. So really, I just sort of two examples of how all of those experiences are being really entirely reconsidered really thought of. There are obviously there are uh, aspects of digital technology and your, your ticket design, your smartphone, just things that we can take advantage of that we had in the past. 
there are also issues of security that I think are a little bit more challenging now and are being, and are being really carefully rethought. But, but another major issue, uh, idea is at the upper levels, much more uh, flexible lobby spaces that can be used in a really w w wide range of ways from informal performances to gala events to being able to use public spaces in a wider way, which is something that we really started working with here at the Four Seasons. We obviously did a lot of that at Mariansky and we'll be doing that again at home. Okay, I think we can take questions now from the audience. I can't really see any, but uh, anybody have any questions for Gary? Here. In your uh, description of, the, or at least in the movie's description of the Mariinsky, it sounded like you had a different scheme that you had to modify in order to build on the foundations that you were given on site. What, if you could have done anything uh, different, what would it? I mean, that's sort of the question on the Mariinsky. Yeah, I, I, I watched that um, uh, as in the, in the film as Jack was describing it, and I think uh, in the end. Uh, what had been, the foundations were recreated for a horseshoe shaped hall, which is what we would have wanted to build. Um, and so a little bit of that is, is uh, I think it's Jack's just general frustration that we didn't have carte blanche. <laughs> because in the end, what we, what we would have been, I think, very much supporting building was a horseshoe shaped facility. And given the kind of the, the lay of the, the land, it was a full block that we, were, that we could use. We, I don't think we would have been putting that horseshoe-shaped hall anywhere else on the block. That was that the main street, close to the main, the main, the main, what would be considered the main street, the front door, the front access. So there's actually fairly little. There was, though, the size of that horseshoe shape and how we reconfigured it. We were coming from a, a hall, experience of a hall here in Toronto where many, a many I think we're, you know, we're, we're many levels. And that that idea as being sort of fundamental to the acoustic of the room was something that we understood from this project here. Different acoustician we were working with, um, uh, Miller BBM, who had a, so they had a different point of view. And a, a little bit, I think, what you're reading there as well is us getting used to a different, a different situation, a different acoustician, a different approach. Where it was, we were promoting more levels within the hall, and in the end, we kind of, we kind of compromised on three levels. Whereas uh, Andre had been, he was interested in one or two, so it's sort of a different. There were differences of approach in that way as well. Um, the the um, process, though, is that, that I think was maybe more challenging was the was the schedule. As we started on the project, they have been building these foundations, and although in the end the construction was quite slow for other reasons, they were incredibly eager to have drawings in order to now. You know, make the modifications that would be our design because they were they were another thing. As I alluded to, we sort of we sort of joined a project that was midstream, and it took a few months for people to kind of make that clear that they actually are building the Perot design, <laughs> but want it to be modified and are looking for a design that can modify. I mean, it's sort of hard here in, in a few minutes to explain how complex and convoluted the situation was. So it wasn't just that we were building on existing foundations. They had a set of drawings that they were that they were building, and they they needed our new drawings very quickly because they wanted to modify it. And the fact that that's what was going on, again, with the with the sort of bureaucracy and this sort of challenging communication, it took several months for that to become clear that that's what was going on. Okay, was there a question up in the balcony? Yeah, the the individual Russian. Uh, who was interviewed at his desk, the gentleman with the mustache, was he for or against? Individual Russian. <laughs> sorry, and what was that? Sorry, I know there are several There are several people who are, which one, uh, and which what comments? What were the comments that he was making? Uh, he was He was more or less neutral. He was the planner. Yeah, because the, the uh, 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 sort of bald guy yes, in front yeah. of the map. So that is the chief architect of St. Petersburg. Um, and so an enormously um, political, politically challenging position. So the, the reason why you are having trouble reading his comments is that he is a consummate professional. <laughs> and he has, he has achieved his goal, if you don't know where he's exactly where he's at. But, uh, but to say in the end, no, he was, uh, he was a, a real advocate for the project um, and carefully 
we, 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 it can be the subject of its own kind of film, the kind of the very delicate stick handling through the, through the approvals process. Uh, and he was, he was instrumental in that, but he had to do it as a, a very, you know, he had to be, uh, uh, you know, a very pro you know, to do his planning role very properly as well. Um, it, it alluded to it a little bit, there was a, a, an architectural critic, um, uh, Yuri, who was assigned to the project. He's a member of the architectural profession in St. Petersburg. It was a very interesting uh, uh, process where a, an architect is assigned to critique our project along with a panel, and then he actually came to Toronto and worked with us for two weeks on essentially adjustments to the design in, in, in uh, response to the comments that had been made. And he toured our facility and got to know what, what we were trying to do as well. And then was really sort of helpful in then making in, in, you know, modest changes, but important changes, which sort of helped with the approval. Okay. There any other? Um, Russia is very infamous for corruption. Some projects, Canadian government projects like AIDS, Russia project had to be cancelled. They couldn't send money from Canada to St. Petersburg, only to Helsinki. Um, did you have any problem, or you don't want to talk about it? <laughs> you have to bribe contractors, you know, to speed up your project. So at the, our, our, our local colleagues, I, I alluded to it before, but to sort of be explicit, Andrei Penferov, Christian Pomorsky, we were working as essentially um, our contract was held by them. It was a it was a, a kind of a partnership where we were involved more on the design side and them on the execution. That's very typical. We work all over the world and uh, often do those sorts of relationships. Um, but uh, what I was alluding to, I, clearly we were we were conscious that there was irregularities going on. Andrew was very careful to keep us out of that, and we really, although we had a lot of we had a lot of challenges working with him, we very much appreciated the fact that. He took care of that side of things. Uh, when it became very clear to us, though, as we started to source some, some uh, materials coming out of Western Europe, and so we would be glass or theater seats from Italy, or you know, just some of the components that wherever you are in the world, you tend to be going to the best place that they make them. And so when we would talk to theater seating people in Northern Italy, they would ask us, well, what's the import duty? When it comes to the border, what will be the import duty? And then we say, import duty, what, what, what kind of import? Well, it might range from 5 to 150 percent. You have to let us know ahead of time. We need to build that price in. So certainly there were aspects of it. Josip is, when he's talking and he's doing you know, three, three years to completion, two years to completion, there was a clear sense locally that the project was moving very slowly. And, and, and no doubt there were aspects of the corruption that was, that was part of that. And it was this drive, he, he very kind of euphemistically, it's the chief planner, euphemistically says, very, he has patience and wisdom is what pushed it through. It wasn't his patience and wisdom, it was, it was it, his, uh, the strength of his reputation, because he's not, he's not a strong man in, the, in a kind of a, 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 a sort of a, uh, uh, an old, you know, really old world way that he's the strongest. He, it's through his you know, persuasion, and it's through the incredible high standard, I think, of the artistry, and those have then created relationships with the central government that were part of the funding, and then I think part of this immense push to say, no, this project must get complete. I mean, so yes, patience and wisdom, but, but in that. Well, I think we have time for one more question up here. Uh, I want to say, I have a question, but I want to say that George Sell, the great conductor, when that hall opened in New York, he was livid with, the, with, with it. And he was interviewed by reporters, and they said, what should we do? And he said, tear it down. <laughs> the question I want to ask is, you were discussing that you were testing out the stage in New York with a conductor, and you were working with a strad and a second musician. What was the evaluation going on with the current hall? What, were they, what was the evaluation of it now, when you were testing it with the violin? The so that was the, the, the violin testing with Gurgit. They were actually, this is for them to consider purchasing instruments. So it's sort of a, a different, uh, you know, kind of a different um, story. But to, to your question, um, our, our uh, acousticians we were working with Paul Scarborough from, from Acoustics did an enormous amount of evaluation of the existing, now called Geffen Hall, to really um, uh, explain what, what the physical uh, shapes or the material or the 
the, the dimensions, what are the challenges, what are the problems with the existing hall. And that was that's sort of what is very, you know, in a minute and a half here, just illustrated by the video, but which really took you know, a number of years in the, in the pre-design phase as analysis is done, computer analysis is done, and all of the, uh, really com you compare to other rooms that have successful, compare the volume of the room, how big is it, you know, cubic, cubic meters, all of these analysis was carefully done in order to understand what the challenge of the room is. We're just right now at a point in the design stage where, where Paul will be taking the three dimension, but the, but the digital uh, uh, model of the new room that we have designed together with him. And he is now doing acoustic testing of that in his computer model as well. And then he'll also, once he gets through that phase, he'll be making a large scale uh, scale model, a, a, you know, wooden model at a scale where you can also with speakers physically test the room in that way as well. So yeah, you're, you're, you're pointing to, yeah, of course, the most important aspect uh, of the design of the new space and, and one which enormous amount of attention will be paid to to ensure that it's successful. My last question to you is uh, when can Nicole and I look forward to the world premiere of your next film about David Geffen Hall? <laughs> so can I, people often ask the difference between um, working in Russia and working in New York. And what I've kind of, I've kind of uh, many times kind of explained, in Russia we, we often just would not know. Something was clearly wrong, project's not happening, stalled, you're being fired, you know, why? What's going on? And you, it would, you would never, it was, we had to get used to the fact that you would probably never know, and of course you had to keep you have to fight and talk to everybody, what's going on, how can we improve this? The difference in New York is you always know what's going on. Everybody's, it's, everybody's hired on their sleeve. If there's a problem, you know about it and everybody knows about it. It's a very different environment. But I think it's also why they considered making a film and, and are not doing it because everybody is so open about challenges. That the, and of course, that's always the delicacy, right, of these kind, of, this kind of filmmaking. What Just to, to say, Yosef's um, telling of this story, I think people who are familiar with his work, who are familiar with Russia, familiar with the design community, it's a very delicate, I think that's, it's a beautiful story, beautifully filmed and told, but that is what he was able to weave, and that he, his, uh, the trust um, that he was able to build, you can see, I, I know how much effort it took for him to get that final interview with Kyrgyz about the, the, the sort of completion of the hall, and that, that sort of level of trust is something that he was able to build and it's why he has, why he was able to complete the film and why it was successful. And I think that there is just generally, it's generally too difficult uh, in North America, the level of trust, so hard to build that level of trust, that in the end the, uh, the Lincoln Center said, no, we don't want a movie. <laughs> we don't want anybody to know how hard this is. <laughs> but the Philharmonic has to move out for a while. Yes. So are they scheduled to back at a certain date or? Yes, yeah, so the, um, I, I know people are preparing that for other things to do, but very briefly, the, 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 the sort of the, the key thing, many, th many things really important to the design, but one of the things that's really important is that it's being done in two phases. So in the summer of, of, uh, uh, of 2022, 2023, they're out for only three or four months. It really was the, the, the crux of how they figured out how to make the project happen. The Philharmonic has nowhere to go. So that was there, one of the, the challenges that they sort of laid out at the beginning of the project is, ideally this would all happen in the summer when we're on tour or we're, we're, you know, we're off for, for August. So we started with that idea, in the end convinced them that we would do two summer phases, and so they'll come back in and perform in an in, in, in unfinished space, which we think can be, well of course it'll be finished enough to be safe, but it'll have a, It'll have a rough and tumble kind of vibe to it. Uh, but with the stage move forward, and then in the, the uh, summer of 2023, they'll move out again for actually longer than the summer, and they'll move back into the winter of 2024, and that's when the kind of the inaugural finish concert will be. But it's sort of one of those enormously sort of uh, interesting but challenging aspects of that, of that project is figuring out how to do it as really a phase renovation. Well, I'd like to thank Gary very much. I think we're all enormously proud of the work that they're doing. Uh, thank you for your time and for being here with us.